Okay, now slowly you can open your eyes. And then rub the palms together and again over the face, head, back and so on. So, are there any questions? <laughs> yes, please. Okay, you could just speak loudly. minds of this because we cannot really feel we cannot feel the sinews we cannot feel you know the uh, fingernails or anything like that yeah that's true so yeah. on one hand we have this type of model that we create on the other hand we have the actual body that we can feel as you said we can feel our, our sitting so what is the purpose of having this conceptual model yeah first I would not call it just a conceptual model as though we're creating some kind of image of the body which is does not correspond to the nature of the body. But sort of the focus here is not on feeling the parts of the body, but on getting a clear mental image of the parts of the body. And particularly in this, the way this is included as a protective meditation, the emphasis will turn to getting a perception of the unattractive nature of those parts of the body. So in that respect, this meditation subject, as I said earlier, it's taught as an antidote to sensual desire. Because according to Buddhism, sensual desire arises from, based on a particular perception. It's the perception of the body as being beautiful and attractive. And so when one gets, through meditation, one gets a clear idea, a clear impression of the unattractive nature of these parts of the body. One takes, the reason why that perception of the body is beautiful can thrive is because we grasp upon the idea of the body as a whole, just the sort of superficial impression of the body. But when one starts delving deep into the body and probing inside, and contemplating what are the parts that, are, that constitute the body, <laughs> we see that they're not very beautiful and attractive, and that way it will act as an antidote to sensual desire. And the other question is, yeah. does it matter the order, or we can just choose, I mean, these 32 body parts are some type of like sample of the body parts? I mean, yeah, I mean, they're, they're not intended to be, be they're not Exhaust intended to be an exhaustive right, catalog. Right. There are parts of the body not mentioned. Sure. The, comes to me, the bladder isn't mentioned, the pancreas isn't mentioned. The eyes? Yeah, in fact, yeah, the eyes are not mentioned specifically. Yeah, so it's just a selection of parts. In fact, in the canonical text, even the brain was not mentioned. <laughs> so that it took text from a later period, added the brain. Thank you. Any, uh, if there are any more questions or any ideas, how do you think about this meditation subject? Yeah. You'll have to take the microphone because we'll have some competition in a moment. <laughs> Hello, Monty. Um, so I was 
That's what I meant. <laughs> okay, just hold for a moment. You could just do a meditation on hearing. <laughs> Sound, sound, arising, passing, arising, passing. Arising, passing. <laughs> passing. Nibbana is... <laughs> yes. So I uh, remembered during this uh, meditation the simile of I forgot exactly what it was, but the woman running, and then there's this man encountering her, and all he saw was teeth, right, yeah, or yeah, the, yeah. Uh, the skeleton, yeah. I forgot which exactly yeah. what it is that he saw. So I was wondering, uh, when is the body part my own body? It's not particularly disgusting or repulsive when it's you know doing this meditation with my own body. So is the theory that eventually you just saw others as such. Um, you, you know what I'm saying? I'm not it, quite sure that I Okay, can. so uh, when I uh, reflect on these 32 yeah. body parts of yeah. my own body, yeah. it's not particularly unattractive. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so it's the theory that still you are deconstructing and eventually yeah. when you look at others, yeah. there isn't this kind of uh, aggregate. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. Okay, thank you. And one thing I have to say <laughs> is sort of my in a way my counterfoil to the meditation on the impure nature of the body. When I go through these organs, one thing that always strikes me, you know, if you look at them, you know, in a butcher shop, say, <laughs> you know, they don't look very attractive. But when you consider the way these organs function, it's quite amazing that the way all of these organs can function on their own, they all do their jobs. I don't have to think about, you know, dictate to my heart, let my heart beat, let my liver cleanse the body of, you know, toxins, let my, <laughs> let my, um, <laughs> bladder send out the signal that it's time to, to urinate. All of this happens just on its own. So I think we have to maybe counterbalance the traditional Buddhist attitude towards the body with some appreciation of the way the body can function as an autonom autonomous whole through our knowledge of modern biology. Yes? That's what I was starting to think, what was making my heart beat, what was making me breathe, yeah. what, what was making all these things function. So I was wondering where it was. What is that part that makes all that happen? What is it that makes all of that happen? Breathe and listen and hear um, and sweat when you need to regulate the temperature of the body. In a way that, that leads, could lead into a perception of anatta or non-self, that there's no self, you know, dominating all of these processes and controlling them and making them happen, but they just happen. I guess it's happening in modern terms, we would say. Do we have any biologists in the room? But, You're a biologist. I'm a, doctor. A, a medical doctor. Okay, so what makes all of these things function the way they do? You say the genetic code? I guess something like that, yeah. You can think of uh, the cell of some type of um, automatic device. So since the first cells appear on Earth, they started really dividing in an automatic way and then they build up all these different yeah, yeah. organisms. Yeah. So it's like a machine. The cell is like a machine, like a little you know, machine that functions continuously. Yeah, but a machine is usually programmed or operated by somebody who puts in, you know, who controls the machine or puts in the code for the machine to work? Well, I mean, if you go deeper into this matter, probably uh, if you go on a planet, like, you know, remote planet, and you're looking for life there, yeah. and you just take a sample of the soil, if there is some difference in the, you know, in the 
minerals there, the concentration, this would be a planet on which you can find life. So I think yeah. life is created by a of difference. So you can, you know, yeah. I don't think you need some type of creator to, yeah. to create life. Yeah. Okay, I think we saw well, the bell that we heard a couple of minutes ago was a signal that lunch is ready. So I think we should break for lunch. And then we'll come back here and we will do at one o'clock, <coughs> one o'clock, and then we'll do a period of walking meditation while meditating on the body. And then we'll continue with the program until a quarter to four. Okay, so let us stand and we'll do three half bows. This is blink blinking. Does that mean the batteries are low? It's blink blinking. I think so. Yeah. 